and welcome to the first lesson in the cells module. Today we're going to be going over the structure of the cell. So this is going to include methods which we use to see and learn more about cells and also the structure of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells and that's going to include all the organelles and what they do within the cell. Okay, so first let's talk a bit about the history of cells. So, before we had microscopes, no one knew what organisms were made up of. So, we can see each other, we can see organs, but we can't see exactly what those organs are made up with, with the naked eye. And the first person that is thought to have viewed cells is Robert Hooke. And he used the word cells to describe these structures. Two other important people. So in 1837, Matthias Schleiden and Theodor Schwann came up with the theory that all living organisms are made up of cells. And this is called the cell theory. And it's a unifying concept in biology, which means that it's accepted by everyone. So there's three main parts to the cell theory. So number one is that all living organisms are made up of one or more cells. Two is that cells are the basic functional unit of all living organisms. And three, that new cells are produced from old cells, so from pre-existing cells. So cells don't just come out of nowhere, they have to come from a pre-existing cell. It's really important that you understand the concept of the cell theory, but you don't need to necessarily remember the names of the scientists or the dates that um, these discoveries were made. So microscopes are tools that we can use in order to see cells and structures of tissues and organs. So there's actually two types of microscope that you're going to need to know about, and these are called light microscopes, which are the ones that you've probably seen before in the lab or on TV. And then we also have electron microscopes. And these are a bit more complex, but they allow for higher magnifications. So let's quickly go over some differences between these two microscopes. So we have electron microscopes and they are extremely large and that means that they can't really be um, moved around easily. However, light microscopes are quite compact and can be easily transported. Electron microscopes, the way that they work, you need a vacuum in order to, um, to use the microscope. However, with the light microscope, you don't need that. All you need is um, the light. So to prepare a sample for any microscope, we have to go through a series of steps. But... Electron microscopes need um, a lot more complicated preparation um, compared to light microscopes. But the main draw of electron microscopes is that you can get over 500,000 times magnification. Whereas with a light microscope, the most you can get is 2,000 times. And also the resolution is much better with the electron microscope. So that's uh, about... 0.5 nanometers compared to 200 nanometers on a, a light microscope. The other key difference is that for a use on an electron microscope, the specimen that you're looking at is going to be dead, whereas with a light microscope, you can also look at living specimens. So if you've got cells that you want to check, um, then you can actually look at them um, whilst they're still alive. So with a electron microscope, a beam of electrons is what is used to magnify the image, whereas with the light microscope, that is done with a beam of light. Two very important concepts to understand when we're talking about microscopes is magnification and resolution. So let's first have a look at magnification. Magnification is how many times bigger an image is compared to the actual real life specimen that you're viewing. We, so we can calculate this by saying the image is equal to the actual size of the image times the magnification. So, okay, so let's go through an example quickly. So if we know the image is 10 centimeters and the actual 
object is one centimeter, then we would do 10 divided by one, and then we would get the magnification, which would be 10 times magnification. One important thing to know about when we're looking at cells, especially, is that we use measurements that are smaller than a centimetre. So we use something called a micrometer. So there are 10,000 micrometers in a centimetre. So just so you have an idea of the size of some things within the cell, a mitochondria, which we were going to go on to later in the lesson, is about one micrometer in diameter. So one micrometer means one ten thousandth of a centimeter. So that's how tiny we are talking. So that's just something to keep in mind. The other thing we need to know about is resolution. So resolution is the ability to distinguish between two separate points. If you think about having two dots on a page, if you walk far away, it'll be harder and harder to distinguish that those are two points and not just one point on the paper. So the higher the resolution, the better we are able to tell different points apart from each other. So if you're looking down the microscope, the higher resolution would mean that it's a clearer picture. You can think about this as well in terms of pictures that you um, take on your camera. You know, if you look at old pictures that are very pixelated, that has a lower resolution than something that is a very high quality and high resolution picture. Okay, so cells can be split into either prokaryotic or eukaryotic cells. So we're first going to look at eukaryotic cells. So eukaryotic cells contain a clear nucleus, uh, which is enclosed in a membrane. So they have a membrane bound nucleus. And this is really the main defining feature of a eukaryotic cell. So eukaryotic cells are usually cells that make up larger, more complex organisms. So plants and animals, for example. And prokaryotic cells tend to be um, single cells and that includes bacteria. So let's first have a look at eukaryotic cells. So we're now going to look at two types of eukaryotic cells and these are plant cells and animal cells. Eukaryotic cells become specialised for specific functions and they can then be organised into tissues and then these tissues form organs and organs go on to form organ systems and we will come to that later in the course. So before we go on to talk about the organelles that are specific to eukaryotes, um, most of the organelles are the same between plant and animal cells, but there are a couple that are specific. So animal cells contain centrioles and potentially microvilli, and these are never present in plant cells. And plant cells have a cellulose cell wall, and they have a permanent vacuole, and they also contain chloroplasts. So animal cells do not contain any of these three things. As I said, one of the defining features of a eukaryotic cell is the nucleus. And the nucleus of the cell contains chromatin. And this is what the genetic material of the cell is made up of. So this is a complex of DNA and histone proteins. Now the nucleus is present in all eukaryotic cells and it's quite large. Um, you can actually see it down a microscope. And it's separated from the cytoplasm of the cell by a double membrane, and this is called the nuclear envelope. And this nuclear envelope has lots of pores in it, and pores are just um, basically holes that allow the mRNA and ribosomes to travel out of the nucleus, and they also allow enzymes and signaling molecules to travel into the nucleus and affect um, DNA transcription. So you're going to learn more about this um, in the next lesson. But for now, all you really need to know is that the nucleus is the part of the cell that contains all the genetic information. The other thing to know is that each nucleus, there'll be um, different areas within that that are more darkly. And these are called nucleoli or the singular nucleolus. And these are where ribosomes are produced within the nucleus.
One of the other really important parts of the cell are the mitochondria, um, or a singular mitochondrion. So this is where aerobic respiration happens in eukaryotic cells. And as we will find out in later lessons, aerobic respiration is really what allows us to be alive and produce energy. So the mitochondria is surrounded by a double membrane and the inner membrane is folded into these things called cristae. And you can see that these form a, a wiggly shape within um, a kind of pill-shaped mitochondria. So the matrix um, contains lots of enzymes that are needed for respiration. And again, like I said, we're gonna go on to this in a later module. Within the mitochondria, there is also circular DNA, which is called mitochondrial DNA. And this is passed from your mother, actually, instead of um, both parents. So we can use this to track maternal lines. Um, we also need to know that the reason why there's a double membrane and these folds with the cristae within the mitochondria is to provide a large surface area for respiration. And surface area is something that we're going to go on into in later modules, but it's a really important concept that will keep coming up about how having a large surface area is very necessary in complex organisms. Okay, next we're going to go on to talk about two types of endoplasmic reticulum, or normally shortened to ER. So there is the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and this is joined to the nuclear envelope, and um, it's formed from continuous folds of the membrane. So you'll see Surrounding the membrane, you'll see these um, projections, and these are called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And the surface of this endoplasmic reticulum is covered in ribosomes, and we're going to go on to what those are in a, um, in a minute. But this is what makes it rough. So we then also have smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and these don't have these ribosomes on its surface. And... Smooth endoplasmic reticulum is involved in production, processing and storage of lipids and carbohydrates. The rough endoplasmic reticulum is responsible for processing proteins following their manufacture within the ribosomes. The next organelle that we're going to look at are the Golgi apparatus and these are flattened sacs and they look quite similar to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And these modify proteins and lipids um, before they're packaged into Golgi vesicles to then be transported to different places around the cell. So we're going to go on um, in a minute to talk about what uh, vesicles are. But for now, what you need to know is that basically what they're able to do is they package up the proteins and then they form a membrane around them and then let them leave to go where they need to go. So the, so we've already spoken a bit about ribosomes and they are formed in the nucleus as we've already discussed and they're made of RNA and protein. So they are found just freely floating in the cytoplasm or they're also part of the endoplasmic reticulum and they kind of um, decorate the outer surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Each ribosome has both ribosome or RNA, which is called rRNA, and proteins. So the important thing to know is with eukaryotic cells, we normally have 80S ribosomes, and this is made up of 60S and 40S subunits. This is all gonna make a lot more sense if you um, either take a look at the YouTube video or if you have um, a look at the attached document, because a lot of this, you're going to need the visual um, resources as well to really understand this. So the ribosome is the site of translation. So when we um, produce proteins, we have firstly transcription, where the DNA is made into RNA or mRNA, and then this is um, then used to uh, as the code to put together the amino acids to make proteins. The ribosomes are what actually put the read the mRNA and put together the the full protein. So we've already spoken a bit about it um, in passing, which is the about the cytoplasm. So 
cytoplasm is just everything within the cell that isn't an organelle. So it's a fluid-like substance. It's mainly made up of water, um, but it also has some other substances within it. And it also is what keeps the cell plump and it allows the cell to keep its shape and its form and has um, a big network of um, cytoskeletal proteins, a big network of cytoskeletal filaments, um, including microtubules, which again, we're going to go on to later in this lesson and also build on more when we come to talk about cell division. So surrounding the whole cell is the cell surface membrane. And as we learned about um, in the previous module, we know that phospholipids are important in forming this membrane. And what we say is that the cell membrane, which is the, um, the barrier around the internal parts of the cell, is made up of a phospholipid bilayer and it is around 10 nanometers in diameter and it is really what um, allows the cell to control what comes in and out of the cell. So it controls the exchange of materials between the internal cell environment and the external environment. So what we describe this is, as is partially permeable and this is a really important remember and this is a really important word to remember because um, you will want to use the exact word when you're describing um, the phospholipid bilayer. And what this basically means is that it's partially permeable. So it doesn't let everything in, it's selective. So it can let things into the cell and out of the cell, but it doesn't let everything in or out. It um, has some selectability on, on what exactly it's letting in and out. So now we're going to just talk a bit about, first of all, microtubules, and then we're going to use this to describe um, what a centriole is and what a centrosome is. So a microtubule is made up of alpha and beta tubulin, and they form dimers, and these then form profilaments. And 13 profilaments in a cylinder make a microtubule. So... Um, these microtubules are super important in performing lots of different things within the cell. They help movement around the cell and they also um, provide support. And microtubules, you can kind of think like them as wires within the cell. So they help things move along. Um, they, f they allow the cell to keep its structure and they are also a bit like a highway. So they allow things to move to and from and they can also pull things um, in, within the cell and we're going to need to know more about that when we talk about cell division. So going on from this, let's have a look at centrosomes. So centrosomes, what we need to know first is what centrioles are. So <laughs> this does sound quite complicated but once you've gone over it a couple of times, it will start to um, really click in your mind. And like I said, it's really important to look at the visuals for this module in particular, because a lot of it is really hard to uh, see in your head if you haven't already seen exactly what these things look like. So centrioles are made up of microtubules. And two centrioles at right angles to each other form a centrosome. And a centrosome is what helps organise fibres during cell division. And these are not found in flowering plants or fungi. Each centriole is made up of nine triplets of microtubules. So I know this all sounds very com complicated, but if you just have a look at the, um, the YouTube video or at the um, document attached to the podcast, then it will make much more sense. When we were talking about the Golgi apparatus, I also mentioned about vesicles. So vesicles are actually, you can think of them as little packages. So they are normally spherical and they are covered in a membrane. And these vesicles act to carry um, substances within the cell. They are kind of like, like a bag, you can think of it like that. One specific type of vesicle is a lysosome. 
and a lysosome contains hydrolytic enzymes. So hydrolytic means that it can um, assist in hydrolysis, which we learned about in the, the previous module. And a lysosome um, is covered in a lipid um, bilayer, a membrane like we already spoke about with the cell. And these specific lysosomes um, are actually important within the cell to break down old organelles. There's many other types of vesicles within the cell, um, which have many different kinds of functions, but these, uh, this is the main one you need to know about for your exams. Okay, now we've, that we've covered all of those organelles that I've already mentioned, we're going to go on to uh, three that are a bit more specialised. So these are not kind of the standard thing you find in uh, most eukaryotic cells, but some specialised cells will have these things. So this is the cilia, flagella, and the mi microvilli. So first of all, microvilli are projections out of the cell membrane that increase the surface area of the cell. So again, for this, you're really going to need to look at the picture to understand this. But as I said earlier, surface area is something that is very important in um, a lot of cellular functions. So these are something that increases the surface area of the cell. Then if we look at cilia, so these you might think look quite similar. But these are finger-like projections um, out of the cells, and these are made up of microtubules. And they, these microtubules can contract and they cause the cilia to move. And this helps um, move things along the surface of the cell. So one example of this is um, in epithelial cells that line the throat, and this helps the cells move mucus up to help us cough. So similarly to this we can then have flagella and this is um so with cilia you have lots of these finger-like projections flagella you just have a single one again it's made up of microtubules and they are like a tail and they allow the cell to move and be propelled forwards one of the obvious ones for this uh, a cell that has a flagellum is a sperm cell so you know the classic picture of the sperm has that tail and that's what helps it move Okay, so now that's covered everything that is a specific organelle to animal cells. And now we're going to go on and have a look at some that are specific to plant cells. So as you can see, most of the organelles we've already learned about are also present in the plant cell, but we've got some added ones as well. So one of the main differences, one of the main differences between the animal and the plant cell is the presence of chloroplast. And they're found in green parts of the cell. The green colour actually comes from chlorophyll, which is within the chloroplasts. And the chloroplasts are much larger than mitochondria, and they're surrounded by a double membrane. We need to know a bit about the structure of these chloroplasts. And they have things within them called thylakoids, and these contain the chlorophyll. They're like um, small pancakes filled with chlorophyll, and they stack up to form grana. And these are joined together by lamellae. So I know this all sounds awfully complicated. It's just one of those topics where you're just going to have to keep going over it and it will eventually stick, believe me. The important thing to know is that chloroplasts are where photosynthesis happens within the plant. Another thing that's very unique to plant cells is the presence of a cell wall. Now, a cell wall is a very rigid structure, and it's made of cellulose in plants, or in fungi, it's made of chitin, and it provides extra support to the cell. It's also freely permeable. So, you know, we learned already that the, the cell surface membrane is partially permeable. The cell wall is freely permeable, so that means it lets anything in and out. Don't forget that plants do also have the cell surface membrane, but outside of that, we have the cell wall. We can think of it a bit like if you have a house and the cell wall is like the front gate. So it's like an extra layer before the front door and the front door would be your cell membrane. The other important difference, as I said about earlier, is the presence of the permanent vacuole in the plant cells. So the permanent vacuole stores sap and nutrients um, within the cell. And it also keeps the, the cells very turgid, which means plump and strong. So, so that, along with the, the cell wall, helps really keep 
the cell, the plant cell is very uniform and allows them to um, form complex structures that have a lot of support. So talking about um, the membranes, another important difference is the presence of the plasmodesmata. Um, I really like this word. And these are pores between cells. So this means that so it means that things can move between different plant cells. And this is again going to be very important in later lessons when we learn more about plants and photosynthesis. And finally, the other different thing in a plant are the tonoplasts. And these are the membranes which surround the vacuole. So um, it's a special type of membrane that uh, surrounds the vacuole. And we're going to learn a bit more about that as well later on. Now that we've spoken about eukaryotic cells, we're going to go on to look at prokaryotic cells. And as I said before, the thing that actually um, defines the difference between these two types of cells is that eukaryotic cells have a membrane-bound nucleus and prokaryotic cells don't. But there are also some other differences that you will more than likely see, which is um, prokaryotic cells tend to be smaller um, and they also have uh, different components in their cell wall. So in general, um, prokaryotic cells are much more simple than eukaryotic cells and they lack membrane-bound organelles. So we're just going to go over some of the um, specific things to prokaryotic cells. So first of all, like we looked at in uh, eukaryotes, they, they do also have ribosomes, but in um, prokaryotes, these are 70S ribosomes, and these are made up of 40S and 30S subunits. Again, go and have a look at the diagrams and it will make much more sense. And these are um, do exactly the same as they would in a eukaryotic cell, but they just have a slightly different structure. As I said with the definition of um, the prokaryotic cell, they don't have a nucleus. So um, what they do have is a nucleoid, and this is where the genetic information is found. So it's not membrane bound, but you will find um, the DNA of the, the cell within the nucleus and whatever area this is in, we call that the nucleoid. But the important thing to remember is that it's not enclosed in a membrane. Um, so then going on from this, we also have another type of DNA found in prokaryotic cells, which are known as plasmids. And plasmids are circular bits of DNA, and they're outside of the genomic DNA that's within a bacteria. So this is, um, plasmids are quite small and they are circular. And this is um, often, this is how bacteria can share um, genetic information with each other and they can this is often how they develop antibiotic resistance and things like that. And um, we'll go on to speak about this a little bit more uh, later in the course. So that covers the differences between the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. So finally, we're going to just quickly talk about viruses. So viruses are non-cellular and they are not living. They are infectious particles and they have a very simple structure. They're much smaller than a prokaryotic cell. Um, and, and what they have is they have a nucleic acid core, which is either DNA or RNA, and this can be double or single-stranded. And they also have a coating around their outside um, made of protein, and this is called a capsid. Some types of virus also have um, another layer called an envelope, which is um, made up of phospholipids. But the important thing to know is that they basically have a nucleic acid core and they always have a capsid. So the important thing with viruses is that they are not living on their own and they are parasitic. They can only reproduce by infecting living cells. So what they do is they infect a living cell a prokaryote or a eukaryote, and they use the protein building machinery, so their ribosomes, to produce new viral particles, and that's and that's how the virus is able to replicate and spread. So 
Okay, so that is all for today. I know that has been a lot of information. Um, so I'm just going to recap what we've learned, but definitely go back and listen um, again and also go and check out the YouTube video or and also have a look at the um, attached documents because this is a, um, a really important lesson to get the visuals on so that you can fully understand everything I've spoken about. So first of all, we looked at the methods used to study cells. So we um, spoke about cells being the basic building blocks of life and how we can study them using microscopes. And we looked at the calculations um, for magnification and we also spoke about what resolution and magnification are. Then we had a look at eukaryotic cells and their structure. So we looked at animal cells and all the organelles um, within that. So some important ones uh, that stand out are the nucleus, um, ribosomes, mitochondria, Golgi apparatus and smooth and rough endoplasmic reticulum. Then we also looked at plant cells and how they differ. So they have chloroplasts and large permanent vacuoles, as well as a cell wall. And then we've also just had a look at prokaryotic cells. And uh, these are much simpler cells and the things that make them different. So they're plasmid and that their DNA is not found in a membrane bound nucleus. And finally, we just spoke briefly about viruses and how they are structured. So hopefully that all made sense. Like we always say, listen back, pause, recap everything. It will take a while to go in. I would really recommend you um, taking the time to draw yourself some um, diagrams of plant, animal and uh, prokaryotic cells and label um, all the different organelles because that's going to be a really important thing to be able to do in your exams. So I hope you enjoyed today and I hope you'll join us back for the revision lesson on this um, lesson. And as always, find us on all your social media platforms. Thank you very much and see you soon. Thank you so much for listening. Remember, you can access additional content on our Patreon page by searching for Equity Tutors, where we have a second 30-minute lesson every week, plus monthly bonus content. You can also find us on most social media platforms. We will keep you updated on new content, and you can find us there by searching for Equity Tutors UK. Please like, share, subscribe and comment wherever you are listening. And if you're enjoying, please leave a review. Bye. Bye.